The U.S. Senate on Saturday acquitted former President Donald Trump of an impeachment charge of inciting insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th, with, which left five people dead. This was the second time that Trump was impeached and then acquitted, as 57 senators, including seven Republicans, voted to convict him but did not reach the two-thirds threshold needed. With the verdict, this chapter of Trump's presidency comes to an end, but without a conviction, there is a chance that he could run again for president or another public office position. We discussed the implications of the outcome on US politics as well as its impact on the rest of the world. For this, I'm joined by Henry Olson, Washington Post columnist and senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. It's great to have you on the show again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. We also have John Nilsson Wright, Korea Foundation Korea Fellow at the Chatham House and Senior Lecturer of Modern Japanese Studies at the University of Cambridge. It's lovely to have you on the show again as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, first of all now, uh, Mr. Olson, uh, so in your country, well, former US uh, President Donald Trump, he was acquitted of inciting violence at the Capitol last month. Now, first of all, I want to hear your reaction to this. Did the verdict come as a surprise to you? It did not. I was disappointed, but I was not surprised. Uh, almost every poll showed that 80 to 90 percent of Republican voters opposed convicting President Trump and Republican senators who wanted to have a future in the Republican Party in the near term were not going to risk that by going against such a strong supermajority of their own party who opposed that. Uh, but uh, you know, nonetheless, it was disappointing given the weight of the evidence. And Dr. Nelson Rye, I, 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 sorry, I also want to hear what you thought of the verdict as well, whether you were surprised by the outcome. No, I think the only thing that I found surprising was that there were seven Republicans who were brave enough uh, to vote in favour of, of um, the impeachment and the decision to, uh, to side with the Democrats. Um, and particularly since, you know, this was the most bipartisan uh, vote in favour of impeachment that we've seen in the United States. Um, I think that's in part testimony to the effectiveness of the House managers. Jamie Raskin's team was very effective in making the case. Um, but the, the bulk of the Republican Party is, as Henry Olson was saying, um, true to form. Um, we're, in a sense, a collective profile in cowardice, uh, I would say, and refused to um, rule in favour of you know, the evidence that was so glaring in terms of President Trump's culpability. And um, well, uh, a poll by ABC News and Ipso shows that 58% of Americans believe that the, the former president should have been convicted. And, well, Dr. Olson, well, the verdict is showed us otherwise, but um, what do you think will be the consequence of the um, acquittal on US politics? Do you think this is going to deepen the bipartisan split in Congress? And also, where does this leave, um, what does this mean for Mr. Trump's supporters? Well, for Mr. Trump's supporters, it's vindication. Uh, the memes going around conservative internet were jubilant on Saturday evening after the vote was uh, final. Uh, I don't think it will increase the bipartisan split, in part because it was so expected. Uh, and the causes for the partisan split have less to do with personal animosity between the members of Congress and a lot to do with animosity and disagreement among their voter bases. So I think going forward, it's a boost for President Trump. He's uh, twice been given the key to future political life. But I don't think it's going to do a whole lot to change the way the day-to-day -day business of either the House or the Senate are going to be run. And Dr. Nelson Wright, many around the world were watching this impeachment trial and they saw this rather as a test of American democracy. And well, President Joe Biden, after the acquittal, he said that democracy is very fragile. What do you think the uh, message of this outcome, this verdict, sends to the rest of, to the, sends to the, rest of the world? Again, I think in terms of foreign governments, there, there won't have been many surprises. They would have expected this outcome just as we have. Um, I think the sense of relief is, of course, the fact that Joe Biden was successful in campaigning for the presidency. But uh, as the president has pointed out, I mean, democracy is a fragile uh, political system. And the, the victory of the Democrats was relatively, um, well, I mean, it was not an... An, ex a, 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 an unambiguous success, given the narrow margin of victory. 
large in the Electoral College. Seven million votes, of course, is a lot of votes. But in terms of those critical swing states that uh, ended up in the Democratic column, it was a close run thing. And we shouldn't forget, of course, that the Democrats saw their majority in the House sharply reduced. Um, I think that for the international community, the hope will be that President Biden will be able to capitalize on his success and return American foreign policy, at least, if not its domestic politics, to a more normal pattern of international relations, with an emphasis on the importance of alliance ties, of returning to a more um, conventional form of uh, American foreign policy, promoting democratic values, uh, strengthening those alliances, ensuring that America's voice is seen as credible and reliable and consistent, and that transactional approach of former President Trump will no longer be the dominant narrative. Um, that will take time and patience. One of the things I think that will be very important, um, and the Biden administration has sig signaled us this already, is ensuring that foreign policy and domestic politics are much more closely harmonized, that there will be a sense in which for the American government, in order to pursue an effective foreign policy, it will need the support of ordinary middle class voters. That will be a real challenge given the polarization in US politics and the fact that there are so many individuals, uh, the 75 million Americans or so who voted for uh, the Republicans. That will be a source, I think, of real challenge for the Biden administration going forward. And as you said, Mr. Olson, the Repu um, most Republican politicians are continuing to back the former president. Does this indicate that Trump is still influential in the Republican Party? And do you personally see him um, making a comeback in the next election? I think the president remains enormously influential. He is the former president. He remains strongly popular among Republican voters, even if he's not as popular as he may have been four months ago. Uh, coming back is a separate question. I think there could very well be a decision by voters that the president uh, was badly treated, was uh, a largely successful president, but that it's time to move on. And the president will be 78. Now, Joe Biden was 78 when he ran, but four years for a person in their 70s is a long time. And we don't know whether or not he will be in a physical condition to be able to undergo the sort of ruling test of endurance that a American presidential campaign requires. Uh, I certainly think he's thinking about it, but it is frankly too soon to say whether he is definitely going to do it. That option remains on the table, but is not a sure thing. And Mr. Olson, where do you think the Republican Party is going with its leadership? And where do you, how do you think it should um, set its future course? You know, the thing about a, uh, the Republican Party is you have to remember that unlike most every other major democracies, uh, we are not a formal party system uh, with formal party leaders. So when there is a president, that person is considered to be the party leader, but is not dependent on election as that position on anyone within their party. And there is no opposition leader when you don't hold the presidency. So there will be competition. President Trump clearly starts ahead in that competition because he is the former president, but Senate Majority Mitch McConnell has his fans and his supporters and a bully pulpit, as we say, from which to make pronouncements. Other senators and governors who want to become president will increasingly be trying to influence the Republican voter base uh, for support. I think the future of the Republican Party is uh, not too dissimilar from where you see the British Conservative Party, which is, say, an alliance between working class populists and a, a strong base, but not as strong of a base, among upper middle class and middle class conservatives, and lead, led by somebody who is capable of articulating a coherent sentence or paragraph or vision, uh, which is, of course, what Boris Johnson can do, whether one thinks he's the most competent manager or not. And I suspect that's where the Republican Party will end up in a sanitized version of Trumpism that may not, that will not be led by Trump. But I could very well be wrong on that. And Dr. Nelson Wright, based on this Trump example and um, the uh, acquittal uh, that he had for the second time, do you think there's a danger that this could empower authoritarian leaders in 
um, or these rise of authoritarian leaders that we're seeing in other countries around the world, particularly in democracies. Um, the coup we saw in Myanmar this month, for instance. I think there's no doubt that um, the storming of the capital and those disgraceful scenes have been exploited by authoritarian governments um, already. We've seen the Chinese media trying to take advantage of that to uh, paint the United States in ways that are intended to undermine its legitimacy and authority overseas. Um, I don't think the impeachment trial and the acquittal of the president will make a substantial difference in terms of the playbook of predictable authoritarian states like Russia and China, which after all are able to exploit not only um, the relative weakness of the United States on the back of the Trump era, but also um, the unwillingness of other uh, international actors to stand up to some of their, um, their authoritarian impulses. It's striking, for example, that the European Union has not been um, more outspoken, for example, on the human rights situation in Russia uh, and the treatment of prominent Russian opposition figures. Um, I think in this context, a lot will depend really on how quickly the American system um, uh, recalibrates itself and uh, the extent to which Donald Trump remains a very visible public figure. Uh, the question of what happens in the future will be partly, I think, dependent on how the Republican Party uh, resolves its own internal tensions, the amount of media attention that is given to the former president. Um, and I think very importantly, and to echo um, my fellow guests' comments, um, the ability of other political actors in the American political system uh, to provide a, an alternative focal point for political um, activity. It's very striking that Joe Biden has moved very quickly, of course, to uh, try and push forward his own domestic uh, political agenda, particularly this uh, 1.9 trillion spending plan, um, working very closely with governors and mayors, I think, of both Republican and Democratic persuasion to try and create this sense of common purpose. Many foreign governments, I think, will be encouraged by that and will hope to, to see more of that um, practical cooperation between both sides of the political spectrum. And Mr. Olson, in the meantime, um, Trump might face uh, a New York grand jury investigation and a criminal investigation in Georgia. Do you think there's a fair chance of him having to face the music? And what do you think is going to be the former president's next steps? Yeah, as a former lawyer, I try not to speak about ongoing investigations because I'm not aware of the facts that the investigators have before them. I certainly would not be surprised if Trump were the Trump organization. Uh, were to be brought before a court of law, particularly in the New York investigations, but I don't think we know enough to be sure of that. I do think that what the president is going to, former president is going to be doing in the next few months is reestablishing a public face. He'll try and reestablish himself on social media. The conservative leaning site Parler, which is a Twitter competitor, came back online today. And I doubt he will get the same coverage of his rallies on television that he once did, but he also will have other online and subsidiary networks that are supporting his comeback bid. And I suspect you'll see more of that over 2021. And I suspect you will see him actively get involved in primaries against his perceived Republican opponents in 2022. And that will be the real test of his influence. It's one thing for polls to say, you like the guy or you feel nostalgically fond of him, it's quite another to follow his advice to unseat a sitting governor or senator or representative who you have independently decided uh, have an independent relationship with. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to end the discussion here today, but that was Henry Olson, Washington Post columnist and senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C., and John Nielsen Wright, Career Foundation Career Fellow at the Chatham House and senior lecturer of modern Japanese studies at the University of Cambridge. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.